and welcome to worship at Plainfield United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Hannah, one of the pastors here, and thank you for choosing to worship uh, with us this Sunday morning. We hope you will connect with God today. In case you didn't know, there's a football game later today, uh, and we may or may not see history as the Bungles, I mean the Bengals, uh, may or may not win the Super Bowl. We'll see. We'll see. Do the Bengals show up? Do the Bungles show up? We'll find out. But we're glad you're here in worship this morning, and uh, I invite you to stand for a moment and greet one another however you're comfortable.
If we speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if we have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if we have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If we give away all our possessions, and hand over our bodies so that we may boast, but do not have love. I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love, Love never ends. ends. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
And all of God's people said, Amen. Welcome. It is really good to have you here with us this morning. If you're joining us online, thank you. We're thrilled to have you with us wherever you're joining us from. And thanks for making Plainfield United Methodist Church part of your weekend, and we're delighted to welcome you as part of the family. If you are with us for the first time, thank you. Uh, we know church can feel intimidating, especially a new one, and we're glad you're here. Whether you're new or can't remember how many times you've been here, we invite you to complete a connection card. You can find these uh, in your PUREX, or you can also complete a digital version of them on your phone at pumc.org slash next steps. And we can receive your paper card along with your offering uh, in the plate at the entrance and exit to the worship service. We offer worship in many styles, including children's Sunday school and youth worship each week. You can find more information about our worship schedule at PUMC.org. We have a few things we'd like everyone to know about uh, today. First, the virtual big game UMW Bake Sale. Uh, it has gone virtual this year. Um, and if you saw the slides uh, before service started, um, I really appreciated the pun. You can help us raise raise some much needed dough for local missions. Uh, so you can donate uh, to the virtual bake sale online or in person. Uh, today and next Sunday, we will receive a collection in the main lobby for Imagine No Malaria, which is the United Methodist effort to eliminate the disease in Africa. And then finally, next Sunday, February 20th, at 7.30 p.m., there will be a pipe organ concert by Hector Salcedo as part of the PUMC concert series uh, sponsored with the Hendrix Symphony. This will be a free event. It will be here in the sanctuary, obviously, because that's where the pipe organ is. Um, Vern, I don't think this can be transported. No? Okay. I didn't think it could, but I figured I'd ask. You'd be the one to know. Um, so here in the sanctuary next Sunday, 7.30, bring a friend and uh, we'll enjoy some beautiful music together. Uh, th that is it. So Miss Charity, take it away with Kids at PUMC. The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. And now for an amazing story. Good morning, kids at PUMC. Good morning, neighbors. How are you today? My name is Charity Ayton, and I work here in preschool programs. And here, back by popular demand, Mr. Giraffe. <laughs> so he's here to help me tell the story today. Our whole series this month is about compassion. And compassion is caring enough to do something about someone else's needs. So there's so many people that have needs. We have needs. Sometimes we are sad or sometimes we feel invisible. Sometimes we have problems and we don't share our problems with people. We, we just kind of bottle them up and keep them inside. Well, our neighbors probably feel the exact same way. They also have things going on in life. And we want to be able to show them compassion. So we need to show people they matter because you matter and you matter and you matter. Everyone matters. The giraffe matters. Everyone matters. Jesus loves each of us. This week, we're going to learn about a Samaritan woman at a well. Jesus went to the well, there was a Samaritan woman there, and he offered her living water. He asked her for water. Water. Everyone needs water, right? We need water, we need to drink water, um, animals need water, everyone needs water. But the water that he was talking about was called living water, which means we can live 
in love and in peace. And we have um, a whole family of believers, right? So it's called living water. When we read our Bibles and study and go to church, that is living water. So invite your friends, tell your family, everyone that you see, and you don't have to say, hey, you wanna go to church with me? Hey, you wanna go to church with me? Which is good, but you can show that people matter by just saying, hey, how are you today? Or thank you for doing that. Or you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Charity, how can I help you? Or you can um, ask people, how was your day today? And, and really be excited and interested in it. So again, compassion is caring enough to do something about someone else's needs. So we wanna show people they matter. We wanna offer them living water and we wanna be kind to others. So I will see all of you in Sunday school. I am so excited to be here. Happy Valentine's Day tomorrow. Happy Super Bowl day today. And I've got lots to do. Goodbye. Today's scripture lesson is from Colossians. If you are following along in the Red Pew Bible, you will find the readings on page 953. If you are using your own Bible or mobile device, we are in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Listen for how the Lord's forgiveness is our cue for how to forgive others. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone is a, is a compliment against another, or has a compliment against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you. It's hard to do, and we've heard it all our lives, forgive and forget. We know that it's what we're supposed to do. At one time or another, we've either heard someone say this, or we've said it ourselves through bitterly gritted teeth, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. Yeah, each one of us has been wronged in some way by someone at one time or another. And it's hard. It hurts for a long time. It feels good to be in the right, to be self-righteous. Uh, Valentine's Day is tomorrow, and I hope you will speak and demonstrate your love to those who mean the most to you. Uh, we sometimes even bear grudges against the ones we love. Uh, I've heard some uh, senior adults through the years tell stories and talk about hurts that they still nurse a whole lifetime later. Something from childhood, uh, parents or siblings, or early in their married life. Each one of us has also been that person who wronged another. Uh, we have each stood in need of forgiveness, of grace. It's life-giving to receive that grace. When we have the chance to restore a relationship, we don't have to forgive others on our own power. We forgive with the very grace of God. 
Divine grace flows in unlimited supply. Godly people give God's grace. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be all acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So, as uh, Hannah mentioned, today they're playing that big football game. It's the end of the professional football season. There may be some opportunities for you to practice forgiveness from this last season. You may need to forgive the other team, or you may need to forgive the fans uh, of the other uh, team. Uh, forgive the official who made that horrible call or missed that obvious call. All that work together to make your team uh, lose the game. There are a few familiar and family proverbs that relate a bit to today's topic. Uh, don't complain without offering a solution. Um, this is one of my favorites. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And of course, uh, the, the ever uh, famous and popular forgive and forget. Bob Goff said, grace is only hard to give if we're still keeping score. Keeping score does not create joy. It does not enhance our lives. Forgiveness warms us up to reconciliation and grace. Forgiveness opens the door to divine love. Forgiveness opens the door to human love. And it's good for you. Forgiving others and yourself does literally reduce your stress. So you have a choice. You can give grace or hold on to grudges. That's the choice we're considering this morning in this uh, worship series. Make good choices. Uh, a good phrase. Uh, a good thing to say to your kids and, and your grandchildren all along. And as we survey some uh, popular proverbial wisdom and consider them alongside uh, the Bible, it'll help us get into this new year well. And see, we do have the power to choose freely. Uh, despite uh, the, the despair that I hear uh, all, all over the place, uh, it, it doesn't matter what I do, uh, nothing will ever change. All the outcomes are already uh, rigged. No, no, no. Holding on to hate is a choice, too. It's a choice. The truth is that ultimately the only power we have is the power to choose our response to things in life. Being wronged by someone may give you that uh, shot of adrenaline uh, along with a boost of righteous uh, indignation. And, uh, and it makes you want to get into the fight. A friend of mine used to say that uh, the first shot of adrenaline you get is uh, free. Uh, your body reacts automatically. You can't help it. But the second shot of adrenaline is on you. You can choose to calm and center. You can choose your response. Because you have to be able to choose to live in love. And uh, a friend of mine suggests that from God's point of view, relationships are the blueprint of reality. And I don't see how holding a grudge or maintaining hatred honors God's overall plan for us and for all creation. And that plan is love relationships. So see, you can choose and your choices have consequences. So, will you give grace or hold grudges? Godly people give God's grace. Now, you might think, uh, what does a pastor ever have to forgive anyone for? Who would ever do anything bad enough that it would make it difficult for the pastor to forgive them? Uh, well, it, it happens uh, to pastors too. Uh, the first big one in my life was when I was a teenager, and there was a significant adult in my life who not only seriously disappointed me, but really, really did me dirty. And uh, my dad couldn't do anything about it. Uh, that wouldn't have been right, and it wouldn't have really helped at all. But dad give, did give me a really good sound bit of theology in, uh, in that, uh, that event, and I've shared it before. He showed me the back of his business card where he had them print uh, this line. People are no damn good, but God loves them anyway. But God loves them anyway. Well, I was a kid back then. It's... Uh, hard for that one to truly count, but, but as an adult, uh, on, on two different occasions, years apart, 
Uh, I, I've had uh, clergy colleagues uh, really, um, really hurt me, um, lied to me uh, in, in ways that uh, did serious harm, and lied about me to others uh, with the intent of, of harming me. Uh, it took me a long time to, to come to the truth of that, but it really was crystal clear and no mistake about it. Uh, it happens to everybody, even pastors. Holding grudges gets us into the neighborhood of sin real fast. And if you'll recall, there is such a thing as sin 1.0 and sin 2.0. Sin 1.0 is when we put ourselves over God. We put ourselves on the throne of our own life and we exert lordship over God. Sin 2.0 emerges shortly thereafter when we put ourselves over our neighbor. We exert lordship over others. When someone has wronged us, the lordship that we may choose to hold over them through a long-standing grudge, well, it can feel really good. It seems to me that a grudge makes my desire to exert lordship over someone else greater than my desire to live under God's grace and God's lordship. Now, it's not just kid stuff, even though we tell kids to forgive others, uh, but this video goes a long way to show us how it is. Take a look. She said I was mean. She made fun of how I look. He stole something. She lied about me. She said I was being a baby. He cut in front of me in line. He pushed me down. He said I was annoying. She talks about me behind my back. She left me out. He made fun of my family. She told on me. She invited everyone but me. He said I'm not his friend. She said she didn't like me anymore. He called me a loser. She hurt my feelings. He lied about me. She said I was dumb. She said I was mean. He called me a wimp. He didn't he made fun of how I looked. He told he me no one liked me. me. She lied he about said me. she didn't want to be friends anymore. He said he hated me. But you know what? I forgave him. I forgave him. I forgave her. I forgave him. I forgave her. I forgave her. I forgave him. I forgave her. I forgave her. I forgave him. I forgave her. I forgave him. I forgave her. Gave her. I forgave. Her. I forgave. Him. I forgave her. If you forgive others, you will be forgiven. Does your heart good, doesn't it? And and the kids make it look uh, simple, but what is it about, and how does it work? Instead of thinking transaction, think more transformation. In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, when we pray, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, it really is better translated, uh, keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. And that word forgive means letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. It's not that giving forgiveness is a condition to receive forgiveness, but it's a condition to enjoy reconciliation where the grace of God can prevail in our lives and in our hearts. We need to forgive others because of what it heals in us to do it. We need to seek the forgiveness of others in order to build the godly community, the gracious community through us, through reconciliation, all of which happens when we share forgiveness. Transformation, transformation. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Forgive and forget. Easier said than done. 
Now that brings us to our scripture for today. This letter to the Colossians was written by Paul from prison uh, in around the year 60 to 62 uh, CE. Uh, the city of Colossae was built on a major trade route in Asia Minor in the southwest corner of modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, Colossae's importance as a business center diminished sharply around 100 BCE when the neighboring city of Laodicea was founded as an active and commercially aggressive competitor. Uh, they made it financially difficult for the citizens of Colossae to keep making a living. Uh, the two towns, along with neighboring Hierapolis, were destroyed by earthquakes in the year 17 and again in 60. They were rebuilt after each earthquake. Uh, Colossae never regained its early prominence and by 400 uh, ceased to exist. The group of Jesus followers in Colossae were mostly non-Jewish or Gentile, uh, and it was probably founded by Epaphras, who is mentioned in this letter. Uh, Paul had heard that the Colossian Christians, who had at one time been strong in their faith, were now vulnerable to deceptions about the faith, and he writes to to bring some correction there. And Paul cared deeply that the Colossians understood the context of their lives within the larger story of God and what that looks like in all of their relationships, even on the job. Can you imagine the jealousy and grudges that probably ensued when their neighbors, the Laodiceans, became a, a significant uh, commercial uh, force and impinged on their, uh, their economy? This could easily have been on Paul's mind as he's addressing this particular community of faith at Colossae. Paul wants the Colossians and us to remember to live like followers of Jesus in everyday life, on the job, at home, recreation, everywhere, all the time. Just like you put on a uniform for your job every day, put on the clothing of a Jesus follower, Paul says. Verse 12, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another and, verse 13, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. See, the Lord's forgiveness is our cue for how to forgive others. And how does God forgive us? but God loves them anyway. Even the Old Testament makes it clear. Psalms 103 says, As high as heaven is over the earth, so strong is God's love. As far as sunrise is from sunset, God has separated us from our sins. So many New Testament passages make it clear that the forgiveness of Jesus is a gift that comes first before anything else. Jesus reaches out proactively and brings us back to life from our dead-end life. Jesus died for us while we were still sinners, and Jesus did that without keeping score. Paul goes on, just in case you're missing the point, verse 14, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I know it's hard to love like Jesus all on your own. So, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And because this is who we are, remember, verse 17, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Forgiveness. A little, a little how to forgive uh, advice from a therapist. Name the anger, sadness, the feelings when you've been wrong. Make some sense of it, even if that sense is they had no idea what they were doing. Uh, or even it was random and it could, could have happened to anybody. Or they really did mean well. Maybe they did mean it, and that's the only sense you can make of it. Second, find safety. Protect yourself from someone uh, who harms you, even if you will later find a way to forgive. Maybe some new boundaries and new practices in your life to be safe. Third, let go of it. Let go of it. And don't indulge in subtle reminders uh, to the perpetrator. If you remind them, the relationship cannot be fully healed and reconciled. Let go of it. 
those who work with children are beginning to deal with uh, this business a little differently. Some are beginning to teach kids to ask each other for forgiveness instead of just saying, sorry. And to say, I forgive you instead of just, it's okay. Because it's not okay, but it can be forgiven. It makes them patch the relationship, uh, uh, heal, uh, and, and to let go of it. Reconciliation, harmony. A little, a little how to forgive from, uh, from a Christian. Uh, Corrie ten Boom's uh, book, The Hiding Place, tells of her experiences in Nazi Germany in the concentration camps. She also tells about a worship service in Munich years later. She had spoken at this uh, worship service, and a former SS officer who had stood guard at the shower door at Ravenbrook was there. He was the first of the Nazis that she had seen since that time. The painful memories poured into her mind. He came through the receiving line, bowing and uh, uh, beaming. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, to think that, as you say, God has washed my sins away. And there was his hand to shake. She could not move her hand to reply. The anger grew and the vengeful feelings boiled up. She saw how ugly that was in her heart and she prayed for help to forgive him. But her hand remained stuck to her side. Jesus, she prayed, I cannot forgive him. Please give me your forgiveness. So she did shake hands with him. And she felt a powerful current from shoulder to arm, from him uh, to her. A love for this stranger sprang from her heart that was overwhelming. And Corey remarked that when God tells us to love our enemies, God provides the love along with our request. See, holding a grudge doesn't make you strong, it makes you bitter. Forgiving doesn't make you weak, it sets you free. Forgiving, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment, loving others this way means at at its base, at, at the very lowest foundation point, to wish them well and not wish them any harm. There are some people in this life that uh, you'll, you'll never develop affection for, you, the, you'll, you'll never like them, and, and that's okay. But the kind of love we're called to have as Christians means to wish them well and not to wish them any harm. The grudge, it will kill you from the inside out. And if you're busy grinding an axe, your hands are too full and busy to accept God's grace and God's gifts. So those colleagues who uh, lied about me and worked uh, to do me harm took a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer, a lot of conversation with a a trusted spiritual and emotional advisor. It took a lot of work and a lot of time. But in the end, there was an amazing act of God's grace that brought about forgiveness and, yes, even reconciled relationships. Miracle of God. Glory to God took me a long time to understand what it means to forgive someone. I always wondered how I could forgive someone who chose intentionally to hurt me. But after a lot of soul searching, I realized that forgiveness is not about accepting or excusing their behavior. It's about letting it go and preventing their behavior from destroying my heart. We forgive with the very grace of God. Divine grace flows in unlimited supply. The image of the river of life, it begins in the book of Genesis at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, God's paradise. The river of life flows continuously and shows up at the end when we will forever live as God intended from the beginning. The river of God flows through the new Jerusalem for one and all. Godly people give God's grace. Last week, I I referenced this devotion by Max Lucado. It's a new day. The choice is yours, based on the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. And here's what Max said about peace that helps us today. Max wrote, I choose peace. I will live forgiven. I will forgive so that I may live. Our next hymn is uh, Help Us Accept Each Other. 
Uh, the words were written by Fred Kahn in 1975. He wrote it to address issues of peace and justice. He was born in the Netherlands in 1929, and Fred lived through the Nazi invasion and occupation, and he saw three of his grandparents die of starvation, and he witnessed his parents' deep involvement in the resistance movement. They took in a number of refugees in their home. Fred began attending church in his teens, but his family did not attend. He became an ordained minister in 1955. And this hymn has become one of my favorites. The first line, help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. And this line in the third verse, to practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's healing art. The table of forgiveness. It's a poetic reference to the multiplication table. You see, they asked Jesus once upon a time how many times we should forgive someone. Seven times? And by suggesting seven, they thought they were being extra generous and extra gracious. Keeping score makes it hard to experience grace and live in grace. Remember? Jesus said to forgive 70 times seven times. Can you multiply that out? Do you know your table of forgiveness? Literally, that's 490 times. In the ancient world, 70 times 7 times was an exaggeration. It was a euphemism. It was the same as saying gazillions or infinity. It's probably time to stop keeping score and just forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven us, as Christ accepted us. As Christ forgives us, forgiveness opens the door and sets the table for love. Practice this acceptance, love, and forgiveness of others until we know Christ's table of forgiveness. Seventy times, seven times, in infinity, until we know it by heart. Until we know it in our hearts. Until our hearts are transformed into greater love. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray to experience more more significantly your love and care for us so that as we grow in grace, we can be living examples of your forgiveness and reconciliation with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we turn to God in prayer this morning, I invite you to a peaceful moment when you might bring to mind any prayer concerns you have, as well as things for which you are grateful. If you're joining us online this morning and the format you're using for worship allows for comments, feel free to type in any prayer joys or concerns into the comment section, and we will be honored to pray with you about these items throughout the week. Let us turn to God in prayer. And dear God, we thank you for your forgiveness. Even when it is something difficult, even when it is something that we struggle with, we thank you, Lord, that you continue to forgive us. That each new morning brings a new day, a new chance to try again. And even if we need a new chance before the sun sets, we ask and you give it to us. Lord, I pray that we will be as gracious and forgiving in our own lives that we will continue to forgive and that we may be prepared to ask for forgiveness and humble enough to do so. Lord, you know all that is on our minds this morning, all that we bring with us into this space. And so, Lord, in these moments of quiet, we take some time to give what it is we have brought with us over to you. We thank you, Lord, that we can bring everything into this space that we do not have to leave part of ourselves at the door or in the parking lot, but we can be wholly ourselves in your presence, and that you love us and accept us, all of us. And so together we raise our voices, praying the prayer that you so taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, thank you for your continued financial support of the ministry. You can find all the ways you can make a financial gift at pumc.org slash give. And for those present with us for worship on site, we're glad to receive your gifts, your connection cards, the paper ones, the offering plates you'll find at the entrance and exit of the worship space. Thank you to those who regularly give to support the good work here. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as we uh, walk with you day by day and experience your grace more and more, Grow our hearts, grow our lives, grow our generosity of spirit and our generosity with our treasure as well, so that your great love might be revealed through our lives and our living. In Jesus' name, amen. Because God gives, we give. Thank you for your generosity. So I invite you to stand as you're able for the closing hymn. Uh, we will sing the hymn to the tune Amazing Grace rather than the one you might find in your hymnal, so you really won't need the hymnal, uh, just use the words on the screen.
A big thank you to all of those who do such excellent work in making sure we can host worship each week. If church and worship are new to you, or if you're new to PUMC, thank you for being here today, and let us know how we might be helpful. We'd love to hear from you. As we were singing, singing of that last hymn, the word bitterness stood out to me. So let us leave that bitterness here. Let us leave that with God as we take the grace and forgiveness out and share those, that with all who we meet this week. Go in peace. Amen.